Hi everyone, I'm Anita Silva. I'm an international trainer and consultant working with non-formal education for several years. And now due to the pandemic, but not only, I'm also a digital facilitator uh, trying to support learners online to uh, pursue their learning journeys, their interests, and uh, hopefully accomplish their learning goals. So uh, to share with you today, I was sent a few questions and I'm gonna try to answer them uh, and hopefully help you out with some reflection points. That's my aim for this little video. First question was, what does it mean facilitating of online learning uh, in my practice and experience? Um, I, I'm not gonna go very directly, immediately on what does it mean to be online and help others learning because I think the most important thing is the research that I'm doing, that I'm seeing myself obliged to do in order to learn about human behavior in online environments. What I mean is that for online marketing, for example, this is not news. When you get an ad in Facebook and that is a lead to a blog, which then has a lead to a service or a product that they want you to, to buy, they've been studying online uh, human behavior for a long time, but I haven't as an educator. I always was lucky enough to have people around me in the same place. And I knew how group dynamics and individual dynamics worked in that setting, right? Like in, in a room. But how do people uh, learn online when they are alone at home and their interface is a screen or um, a, a computer, a mobile? What are the dynamics there? I'm not fully aware of those. So a lot of uh, facilitating online learning is researching about human behavior in these conditions. Because only when I start understanding how human behavior works in online environments, I can start figuring out what is my role into that. Um, then secondly, what I found out is that the best I can hope for is that I can offer that extra support that the learner will not find already online. What I mean is that whenever we want to learn anything, we just go to a YouTube tutorial. Like that's the first thing. doesn't matter if you want to learn how to make your own tofu or if you want to learn how to, let's say, address your boss for a promotion, right? The first thing we do is probably there's a YouTube tutorial about it. So if I'm just going to provide tutorials for things that are out there, I'm not adding any value. So I try to figure out what is that extra support I can offer. And so far what I found out is that I can curate resources that do exist, but people don't have to look for them. I'll curate them and put them together in an exhibition, let's say an online exhibition, it might be a hop module, um, for them. And then I'm increasing reachability, they can access it very easily. And then I can offer my own experience. This is something they will not find online. My own tips and tricks from the things I'm, I have a bit of expertise on. So these are the things I think I can help, like select materials that already exist for participants and offer that extra personal sharing of what I have experience on. And then I think this is it. I mean, for me, uh, facilitating online learning is a lot about this. It's a lot about research and trying to add that little bit that people are not finding by themselves online. Maybe this sounds very little, but that's what I think it is. Um, what specific actions this leads me to do? Well, first of all, I ideate a lot. That might sound very generic, but it's not. I do spend a lot of time with papers and screens, just figuring out, trying to produce ideas to create innovative, activities online that go beyond a Zoom call, that go beyond a video like this. So maybe an exercise where people can use their environment, maybe a board game online, maybe uh, something else. So how can we make this interesting? I was involved in the design and implementation of the HOP course Youth Pass Love Score. I did it together with Michael that you know very well. and. There, for example, we had to think, can we have illustrated videos that would really convey the message better than us, better than text? And how to design these videos was the things we were ideating for. So how can we create an imagery, a narrative, a visual narrative 
that kind of really uh, will portray the message we want to we want to bring to participants and keep their engagement. So I do a lot of ideation. That's one of the tasks I do. Um, I offer contact points that um, add some meaning to the whole experience. That means I organize a lot of Zoom meetings, Teams meetings, and I try that they are not really sessions like I do normally presentially. I try that they're not based really just on a PowerPoint or on me presenting content, but it's really a platform for people to feel that they have a community of learners. And I think this is one of the roles we can have is to allow people to access a, co a community of learners where they feel they can get peer support, where they feel that they have a safety net, they feel that they have companions that are learning at the same time as they are and that there are valuable sharing going on there that can help them. So I, I try that my online meetings are mostly about participants sharing between them and not so much uh, me sharing with them. I can do that in a video like this. Now I know that videos like this are very boring and it's already six minutes. Uh, if you endured until now, congrats. So maybe I propose you to stretch a little bit or pause the video and go do something else, come back in a minute because uh, 15 minutes videos are hard to, to bear. So go ahead and do that or just you know stretch, whatever you need to do, okay? Going for the next question. What are important competences to facilitate online learning? Well, for me, one important competence or a part of a competence is your attitude. And the attitude I would endorse is to go beyond the obvious. Um, when thinking of an online session, go beyond like sitting in front of a screen in a Zoom and try to think, can participants build an art piece together? Can they do that physically with objects they have in hand? Or can they do that digitally? Can I be totally obsolete in this session? Can somebody else be facilitating? Maybe one of the participants or a group. Can we skip Zoom altogether and do something else? What would that be? Um, can we play board games? Would that be a learning uh, added value? So I'm trying to go beyond the obvious all the time and I think that's um, something that we need to be competent on. Otherwise, we're just gonna end up showing PowerPoints online, and that's highly ineffective, I would say. Also then, that leads me to questioning myself, and I would say that's another skill that we need, is to be able to question our role. My role as an educator online, what is it? Is it really to bring new information? Do people need that from me? Uh, if the information is out there already, like we said, or do they need me to actually design a flow online that will help them emerge into the content without even thinking about it, just like a rabbit hole. Sometimes this is what I think. I'm, I have to develop rabbit holes. You know that when you go on YouTube and you start seeing a video and then something pops up on the side and you click there and then something else pops up and three hours later you're looking at some video that you never thought you wanted to see on that moment. I'm thinking like, how can I disguise learning into playfulness and into this seamless flow in such a way that people don't even understand they're learning but they are um, and i think that's a competence on itself right so constantly designing these rabbit holes um, another thing is i think educators should be able to either design content content in a very attractive way or get used to hire people who can do that for you. But information, when it's displayed digitally, has to be valued. And the way you value information will greatly affect the engagement you create on your learner. So on a normal session in a room, I would make a flip chart show, showing something. Maybe I have some drawing skills and I can make a beautiful flip chart. Maybe I have no drawing skills and I make an ugly flip chart. People are still there, they're not gonna leave the room and they're gonna see that flip chart either way. It's not like that online. I cannot just produce a bunch of text, make it that it takes five minutes to go down and expect people to read it. They won't. So how can I transform that content, that piece of information into something that is attractable, that is relatable, that people really um, want to explore, maybe even see again because they missed some details, you know? So I want to create that effect that people are, are really 
um, drawn to the content. And so we have to learn either to do it ourselves or to hire other people. Um, and then I would say that another skill, a very clear skill, is to know how to design activities for online environments. Again, a debriefing doesn't happen the same way online as it does in real life. Instructions for a game don't happen the same way. Small groups work, they don't have the same dynamics. So you have to build up these competences of understanding how these things work online. Okay, I hope you're still there with me. So again, take a minute, go make a tea, stretch, stand up, make a funny face, whatever you feel like. And I'm almost done here. Two last questions. What challenges do you experience as a facilitator of learning online and how do you overcome them? Most of my challenges have to do with people, <laughs> the people I work with and myself. So first, I think my first challenge is to overcome my own references of learning or my lack of them. I've learned online a few things, of course. I've done uh, Moodle-based courses myself. I've, I had I already teached using Moodle before when I was teaching in university, but I don't have that many references. And so the references I have are from physical environments, face-to-face -face situations, and this limits me. So that's one of my biggest challenges, is to overcome my own uh, references of learning. The second is to work with colleagues that have very different references as well, and sometime, sometimes very um, not so updated digital skills to work. And so sometimes it's hard to discuss a digital environment if people don't have those references. I find it really helpful nowadays that I have to show them stuff. So when I'm working in a team with colleagues that are great at what they do, but they don't have the digital skills, then I need to show them what I mean. If I just say, oh, let's build this great forest in Miro, they might be totally lost and overwhelmed. So one of the challenges is really to, how can I make it visible for them and how can I help them build these competences? Then another thing is that my clients don't have a lot of references and sometimes they're asking, they're asking things that are not really feasible. I've heard of clients saying that, well, because of COVID, we need to have the whole group there, but you're going to be online facilitating the session while they are in the same room. And I'm like, how am I going to do that? I'm going to sit on a circle, but I'm on a screen. How can I hear the last person? Uh, how do I know what's going on on small groups? What am, why? Why are we doing this? Or clients that say, oh, we have this little uh, session for 30 people. Will you do it? I said, okay, I might need a help. Oh, we can help you. And then in the end, it's 300 people. And they're like, yeah, can you still do it? Basically, it's just you talking on a screen. It doesn't matter how many people are on the other side. And this is their reference of learning online. Me talking on a screen. That's not what I do, unless in videos like this. So uh, to explain them that that doesn't work, that if you have 300 people, then I need a big team to be able to create this flow that people actually are learning. Uh, otherwise, it's just a talk, and I'm not so into that. And I would say that my last challenge that I noted down here to tell you, to share with you, would be the volatility of participants' engagement. So, as you probably felt, this video is 13 minutes by now and it's too long already. So, participants' attention is very elusive, it's very short. So, how do I keep people's participation levels high? How can I engage them when I'm not there to tap on their shoulder and say, come on, let's go and learn together? How do we do that? So for me, that's a big challenge. I'm still learning about it and I'm very happy to uh, learn more, maybe with all of you on this. Last question is, how do you motivate learners to engage fully and take the most from learning online? Well, so far, my techniques is to create an inviting and safe environment from the beginning and informal so that people feel that they are coming to a place where they are wanted and they are desired and they are welcome. So that's for me like my biggest strength is to create an environment that is really informal and cozy and people feel welcome to be there and they, they think, oh yeah, I'm in the right place. So that's, that's what I try to create. Um, then I'm always, whatever I'm doing in the back of my mind, there's always the question, am I adding value? Am I adding value here? Is there anywhere on YouTube where they can find this? Then stop doing what you're doing, Anita. 
do something else, add value. So um, that's kind of one of my ways to keep sure that I'm motivating people is to make sure that I'm actually offering something that they don't find anywhere else. And thirdly, by promoting responsibility and accountability in participants. So creating systems that uh, engage people in other ways. That can be group assignments or assignments in pairs or buddy systems, um, different kind of tasks, gamification, ways that people feel accountable. They feel like, oh, I should be there. I should be learning. Uh, and that gives them that extra uh, intrinsic push, motivation that they need. So that's a little bit of what I do. I hope this video uh, brings uh, nice questions for you and nice reflections. I wish you all the best and I hope that you enjoy this course as well. Bye-bye.